Okay, everyone, welcome. Uh, so it's really great uh, today. Um, we have uh, Mark Ran from NVIDIA Research to give us a talk on machine learning for design methodology and NVIDIA optimization. So Mark, um, I just learned yesterday that um, Mark is actually uh, one of the first PhD students of our team member, David Pan uh, from UT Austin. Um, Mark got, uh, uh, obtained his PhD uh, from UT Austin uh, in 2006. And after that, I believe he spent um, many years uh, 15 years at IBM uh, Research uh, before he uh, joined uh, NVIDIA Research in 2016. And right now he leads the design automation research group at NVIDIA Research, um, with, uh, working on machine learning applications in design automation and the GPU accelerator, the EBA. I mean, he um, has published uh, uh, many papers in the field of design automation, uh, also uh, including several book chapters in logical synthesis and the physical design. Um, got a bunch of best paper awards, and today we're really excited to have him to tell us more about um, machine learning for EDA optimization. Mark, the floor is yours. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Yusu, for your introduction, and thanks for inviting me to uh, give this talk. Uh, I'm very excited to uh, uh, share my thoughts on how to apply machine learning uh, AI uh, for for chip design. Um, so uh, before I start, let me just uh, uh, play uh, a little video. I think it, you know it's a uh, it's a very very nice video that Nvidia prepared for. Uh, I am a visionary. This is the, the video that Jensen showed in the, in the GDC this year. And uh, uh, actually, next month, we're going to have uh, another GDC, and uh, it will be a, a even nicer video. So stay tuned. I would encourage you guys to actually uh, go, you know, like attend the GDC. I am a guardian protecting us on all of our journeys. Ensuring our most precious passengers make it home safely. I am a hero searching for hidden threats in every cell. And delivering precise care with every breath. Taking on complex tasks in the most challenging environments and giving our crops room to grow. I am a creator, transforming the very fabric of our everyday lives and using the creative DNA of the masters to inspire a new generation of art. I am a learner, taking just minutes to discover how to crawl, walk, and stand on my own. I am a storyteller, giving emotion to words. I am even the composer of the music. I am AI, brought to life by NVIDIA, deep learning, and brilliant minds everywhere. All right. <laughs> um, hopefully you guys enjoy it. Um, so yeah, uh, AI has been um, making uh, different bound, you know, uh, progress uh, recently, and it's uh, uh, majority enabled by uh, NVIDIA machines. 
So um, this is the uh, yeah, new uh, generation of uh, uh, GPUs and their systems. So for example, this uh, uh, H100 GPU can have four petabytes of int8. And uh, if we, we put four of uh, eight of them together, it becomes uh, the uh, HDX, uh, which has 32 petabyte, uh, petaflops uh, of compute. And then we put uh, eight, uh, 32 of these uh, 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 DGX together. Uh, that's a super pop that can exceed one X uh, flop of compute, right? Uh, these are all uh, ready to use for uh, AI. And um, uh, I, I, we actually uh, donated a, a couple of uh, 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 A100 uh, DGX boxes to Telos. So we'll, uh, uh, hopefully uh, you guys will make good use of that and uh, make good progress in applying AI uh, in optimization. So uh, that being said, um, there are uh, a lot of uh, challenges to design these children systems. So the question we're asking is, uh, what can you know AI uh, do for chip and system design, right? Um, so the that's the goal of uh, our organization. So I lead the design automation research uh, at Nvidia, and uh, so we're we're trying to meet the design challenges, uh, such as uh, the productivity challenge. Uh, you know the number of transistors increase uh, uh, dramatically. You know eighty billion of transistors in the latest chip. Uh, which uh, requires you to design uh, and verify. Uh, uh, actually, it's a, even a harder problem. And um, there are physical limits, like you know, the power envelope. Uh, you cannot exceed in a certain uh, number of watts. Uh, and also scaling challenges, uh, because we are going to 3 nanometer and beyond. Um, and uh, then there's uh, technology innovation challenges, uh, such as like how do you come up with new design ideas, as well as how, how to come up with new design automation methods. Uh, so these are the challenges. So uh, our goal, uh, my, the team goal is to uh, improve the quality results of design and also productivity uh, for designing these uh, products. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, we would uh, also like to uh, solve challenging problems faced by the entire industry. Uh, so our research strategy uh, is basically apply machine learning, deep learning, AI, and GPU acceleration to design automation. So uh, in my talk, I have uh, uh, basically three sections. Uh, so in the beginning, I'm gonna give a uh, very high overview of uh, uh, design methodology, like how, how machine learning can help uh, chip design uh, in terms of design methodology. Uh, this is a, a more like a high level overview. Uh, and then uh, I'll dive into, uh, into uh, a specific area, which is EDA optimization, and uh, focus on uh, introducing several techniques that I think are promising uh, for uh, for the EDA optimization. And then I would uh, come come back to the you know uh, more uh, practical level uh, and uh, explain like what kind of framework uh, that uh, is more practical in. Uh, Making uh, all those things working together, machine learning and uh, and the traditional EDR algorithms. Okay, so let's uh, start with the first kind of overview of machine learning for design methodology. So um, for for design team, uh, we usually you know uh, structure the design process uh, in 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 terms of methodologies, right? So we can call it flow. A design flow or design methodology, they, they all mean the same thing. So for, I am uh, just giving like uh, two high level uh, examples. So for digital flow, uh, usually, you know, you have architectural design, you have RTL design, you have physical design. Um, and, uh, and this reputation is not even here. Uh, and in physical design, you have like synthesis, placement, cost synthesis, optimization, routing, right? Uh, so all this are kind of uh, method this is our methodologies. So you have high-level methodology, you have low-level methodology, you have many methodologies. So analog and schematic design and they are design. So uh, I think we can basically orient ourselves in like thinking uh, uh, AI problems in terms of uh, how, how do we improve this uh, methodologies. So I think we can uh, think about how AI improves methodology in terms of uh, these five area. 
Uh, so if we structure the dysmorphology as a as a like flow graph uh, with like a number of steps and the uh, um, the uh, uh, directions, you know, from step to step, uh, then um, of course AI can help uh, bridging the gap between the steps, right? Because the different steps have different assumptions, different objectives. Uh, so uh, the gaps between them usually cannot be handled by existing methods. So that's something uh, AI can help. Um, and uh, second one is, uh, of course, you can apply uh, a better optimization within each step, as well as a better optimization for the whole flow, right? Uh, or the whole methodology. So this is a, a in, definitely like the one of focus that, that your, your center is uh, focusing on. Um, and uh, and also uh, each step take time, so uh, we can also speed up these steps, right? Um, and uh, some steps are manually designed currently. Uh, you know, if we can replace that with automation, then then that'd be uh, great, right? So AI can automate uh, some of the manual steps as well. So uh, this is like high level uh, perspectives. And uh, overall, you know, of course we only improve QOR and productivity. So let me give uh, some uh, examples, right? Uh, so this is uh, one example for bridging the gap between the steps. Uh, RoundNet uh, is uh, one of the early works in applied uh, machine learning to triple design. So in, in RoundNet, the, uh, the, the steps it's talking about is basically the placement and routing, right? So uh, placement and routing are different steps. Uh, however, uh, there are uh, problems that, that the routing step uh, cannot be fixed by routing alone, right? So if you have like VRC errors at the final routing step, sometimes it cannot be fixed. So you have to like change your placement. So uh, if you can have a good uh, prediction of your DRCs at the placement step, then you can try to avoid uh, creating those uh, DRC problems during placement. So uh, this work uh, is trying to use features available at the placement step, uh, trying to predict the DRCs at you know after routing, and uh, the features include like pin density, macro placement, uh, some uh, simple routing estimation uh, based on Rudy algorithm, and uh, is able to do the DRC hotspot prediction um, based on this uh, 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 fully conv convolutional neural network model. Uh, this is also called UNet. So you have image coming in uh, and uh, it's getting uh, 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 compressed and, and then you know basically it's down sampled and up sampled again to, uh, to, for another image prediction, uh, very commonly used in sec uh, image segmentation tasks. So yeah, it's able to come, come up with good, good numbers, uh, better predictions than other methods, like SOE and linear regression. So this is powerful deep learning. So um, and another example, uh, uh, for uh, better optimization within the step, right? So I'm talking about better op optimization, how do we perform better optimization within the step? Um, so this is, a uh, uh, let's consider this uh, uh, transistor sizing, right? transistor sizing step in analog, right? So in analog design, uh, the, you have to figure out what the, what's the right size, right, to choose. Um, so that step uh, usually done manually, but uh, there's a lot of work in how to uh, how to do it uh, actually automatically, right? Using algorithms. Uh, so uh, we are taking this uh, um, Bayesian optimization framework. Uh, so so uh, Bayesian optimization can uh, basically, given the number of parameters, is able to uh, build a surrogate model, uh, and uh, which will basically predict the, what's the uh, best samples that that you can choose to try next iteration. Uh, and um, uh, iteratively, it can uh, sample uh, the best parameters uh, or in the sizing network, it's uh, uh, figure out the best size uh, for this data list, right? Uh, the, the key here is uh, uh, when, you, when you're doing this uh, once at a time, uh, you have to make sure your entire flow uh, are considered like, essentially, you know, in the, in the analog design, uh, the sizing is just one step, uh, later on you have uh, like parasitic paras layout, and once you have layout, you have to do parasitic predict, uh, extraction and get the parasitics, and that's the the real thing that you you want to simulate. Uh, so so we need to like basically consider those parasitics when we're actually doing the sizing. Uh, so that's why we use net neural networks 
uh, uh, in you know both the surrogate model uh, uh, using graph networks in both the surrogate model as well as parasitic prediction um, that will give us uh, a, a good uh, you know um, uh, 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 good model for for the optimizer. And uh, uh, as shown in this graph, compared to other methods, uh, the, the number of simulations required to optimize is dramatically reduced, and the runtime so so it's uh, much faster uh, to to optimize. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, another example is uh, better optimization of the flow, right? So previous example talking about optimizing a single step. Now we're talking about the optimizing the entire design flow. So let's consider a flow that's uh, you know like a, a physical design flow that includes synthesis as well placement all the way to locking. Uh, so this is uh, one of the areas uh, that's been I guess like uh, uh, been done a lot like. You know, like in cadence and synopsis, both have uh, like AI driven uh, flow optimization, right? Uh, so, yeah, definitely something that the people think is doable and very practical. Um, so, here, well, we, we just uh, uh, show one of the our works in this area. It's called a FIST. Um, and uh, it's, uh, um, it, it's basically trying to leverage the uh, 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 Clustering of a similar uh, similar parameters. So you know it, when when you have multiple parameters uh, in a flow, uh, the you can actually cluster it in a way that uh, uh, you can reduce the search space. So uh, it, so this work is uh, basically leveraging that idea and uh, trying to uh, do a better exploration of the parameters as well as a better exploration once you have build a build a build a model. Uh, so, you know, on the left side, you can see this is a doing uh, a, a QR uh, search, right? So uh, the the uh, y axis is the timing, and the, the x axis is the area. So this is basically searching like what's the best uh, combination, uh, best point in, in terms of timing and area uh, uh, with different parameters. It's uh, just kind of doing the uh, random search kind of thing. It's called a, because it's the exploration stage. And uh, once once it's uh, it's done, it's gonna build a very good model trying to predict the Pareto front, and uh, and then it's going through the exploration stage, uh, which will focus on the focus on the the Pareto front when 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 we're doing the search. Uh, so yeah, uh, okay. Uh, and third third example is about speed up a, a step. Um, so many these automation steps uh, take a long time to do. Uh, because it requires you to um, simulate some physical equations or doing like a very uh, 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 accurate uh, analysis. Uh, so, for example, uh, uh, IR job prediction, uh, IR job prediction, uh, which requires you to uh, solve the you know uh, the equations and uh, and come up with the, the IR job. Uh, the equations are very big, you know, just millions of variables. Uh, so, usually take hours uh, to simulate. Uh, a particular vector. So uh, here we try to actually, uh, instead of uh, uh, to compute, uh, we just build a model to to predict. Right. Uh, so this is different to the like bridging the gap kind of thing, because bridging the gap means the uh, the up, the process hasn't happened. Right. You're trying to predict something that hasn't happened. Here it's basically speed up compute because uh, the the physics are already here. You can just compute it. You can run your analytical algorithm. It will tell you the results. Um, so nothing to there's no uncertainty. Okay, um, but uh, we just want a faster methods, uh, approximating methods. Um, so uh, it's uh, it's using a similar uh, unit kind of net network to predict the IR. Uh, one additional uh, um, uh, features it has is uh, in addition to generate this uh, feature map. It also generate the uh, um, importance weights uh, based on other known features associated with uh, IR job. So this has become a linear regression, and uh, because of the simplicity of this linear regression, the uh, inference uh, is uh, much more uh, more accurate. So so basically, the model is more transferable, uh, and. Uh, this uh, predicted IR job and ground truth looks very similar. Uh, and because the inference runtime is only seconds, um, that means we can actually simulate 
many many different vectors uh, in our design process. So 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 that's actually very important for for the power analysis of the design because uh, you want to simulate as many vectors as possible. Uh, so using machine learning model that helps uh, uh, helps speed that up. Okay, so I'm gonna uh, switch gear to talk about the uh, uh, ML for uh, EDA optimization. Um, and uh, uh, before that, uh, I guess uh, we are good on time, so I'll just uh, proceed. So yeah, this, this is a very uh, interesting topic because uh, uh, you know optimization is uh, one of the two most fundamental problems in, in EDA, right? The other is uh, analysis, right? So you know basically for EDA, it's like you analyze and then and you optimize, right? And then you analyze and optimize. So so um, now, so let's look at the optimization, right? So usually the optimization problem can be something like this, right? You, you minimize a function based on a number of variables, and then these number of variables also needs to be subjected to uh, a number of constraints, right? So uh, assuming the the, the, the the f function can be multiple multiple objectives, the, the constraint can be multiple objectives as well. Um, so these functions could be nonlinear, non-convex, and disparate, right? Uh, and uh, the function dimensions are very large, like you know, millions of variables, because it's a uh, large chip design. Um, so what are the algorithms, right? So these days, I, I think in the uh, EDA flow, um, people use a lot of greedy algorithms, a lot of meta heuristics algorithms. Um, and uh, uh, for uh, some problems that you can big, use linear optimization, then it will become linear optimization, like placement. Uh, in some problem, you can apply like a mixing integer programming, uh, you know, specific problem can be applied to like network network flow and uh, um, some you know uh, there's a whole a lot of algorithms is not not able to uh, list all of them. Uh, but usually, uh, it, those algorithms cannot achieve optimum right for for specific task uh, because most of the problem can be hard, so it's very hard to achieve optimum. Like for example, in uh, in uh, Jason Cohn's uh, uh, paper benchmark published the, uh, uh, many years ago. Uh, we see a, a very large degradation, right, in terms of uh, achievable violence uh, for placement uh, versus uh, the optimal one that we know, right, based on this benchmark. Uh, I'm I'm not sure what's the current status, but I I don't think it's going to be like uh, optimal, right. Um, so additionally, these functions uh, might not have analytical form, right. So they they you know like for example congestion minimization, like how do you analytically come up with the congestion formula? Right, very hard. Um, and uh, uh, and this function evaluation might take a long time to evaluate, right? Like time analysis, you have to go to uh, IR job analysis and take a, take a long time. So these are the challenges of OED optimization. And um, I mean, uh, all the machine, uh, the tools today, they have to handle this and uh, they, they did a good job and that's why we can design chips, right? Uh, however, can we can we do better, right? So, so that's why, uh, we want to, we're looking into machine learning techniques uh, in improving uh, this optimization problem. So uh, there are three techniques I want to uh, uh, talk about today. The one is reinforcement learning, uh, the second is self-supervised learning, and third is a physical based model. Okay, and I'll go through one at a time. I'll talk about their advantages and the challenges uh, 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 for each method. Uh, okay, so start with uh, reinforcement learning. Um, so to uh, map a re uh, uh, optimization problem to a reinforcement learning problem, uh, you just need to map it like map this formula into an MDT, right? The uh, mark of descending process. Um, so essentially, uh, you need to create your own states and your own actions and your own reward, right? Um, so there are two ways, at least two ways to do this, like very two, two common ways. One is you can make your uh, states based on the number of uh, variables, the, basically the, at each stage, at, at each uh, um, step, you're gonna make a decision on one of the variables, right? So, you know, let's say at the, at the step K, you, your current state is you have already decided x1, x2, up to xk minus 1. And uh, now your task is to make action on xk, 
right? So essentially you decompose this problem into a sequence decision problem or a sequence MDP problem, right? Um, another way is to, uh, um, is instead of doing like se this sequence way of uh, generating actions, uh, you can actually make it like transform based. So, so let's say your state actually involves your current assignment of your variables. And your action is to figure out how to transform your current uh, set of uh, variable assignment to another set of variable assignment, right? So kind of making transforms in your uh, state assignment, right? So either way works, it, 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 will, it will have a different, um, different uh, efficiencies, uh, but the, all, the rewards are always, uh, you know, the, minim the function you want to minimize, as well as the constraints you want to satisfy, right? So you need to somehow combine these two uh, set of equations into single reward, right? So you can, uh, this is commonly done in, in constraint optimization anyway. Um, okay, so this is a high level op optimization framework for our reinforcement learning. So let's look at the line example. Oh, actually before that, um, I want to say uh, the uh, um, reinforcement learning algorithms versus the uh, other algorithms, right? So commonly used algorithms such as simulation and meaning, uh, heuristics, dynamic programming, evolutionary algorithms, right? So uh, the reinforcement learning framework actually uh, uh, have many similarities uh, to these commonly used algorithms, right? Uh, but it has some advantages as well over these algorithms. So for example, compare uh, reinforcement learning algorithms with the simulated, simulated learning and the heuristics. Of course, the reinforcement learning can have very sophisticated uh, transferable policy, right? So learning and the heuristics, they, uh, they're making changes, making moves based on some simple rules, but RL, you know, you can build a very complicated model to, to figure out what's the action to take, right? So you can make a sophisticated model or what they call the policy. And this policy was trained on some data, it can probably infer on your like new data, unseen data, which is not doable with similar meaning of heuristics or any of the other methods. Uh, like compared to dynamic programming, uh, the things like down programming, you need to know exact dynamics, right? And also it's difficult to scale. So reinforcement learning can be more scalable and also it doesn't ha have to know the dynamics. It, you just need to compute reward. Um, and uh, and uh, also compared to efficient uh, compared to evolutional algorithms such as uh, uh, genetic algorithms, uh, you know basically basically the uh, the uh, uh, RL is uh, uh, is is gradient uh, it computes the gradient so so it, it's more efficient right. The evolution algorithm have no gradient you have to uh, you have to search a lot so more efficient computation versus those. So this is just the uh, uh, some review but let me. Uh, show uh, an example, right? So uh, I'm gonna uh, use the only cell uh, as example to uh, illustrate how RL can work for the automation of optimization. So uh, only cell basically is the automatic the, uh, uh, standard cell layout tool. So uh, it's, it's actually lay laying out the cell itself, right? So each standard cell has many transistors. Uh, some cell is as large as like a, 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 a 150 transistors, right? Um, so, so it has to be laid out in a in a in in, in a sh uh, inside this box, and, and that, that's 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 called a cell, right? And the cell will be used in the uh, placement of, of a larger chips. Uh, so, uh, I'm actually comparing two methods. I'm going to compare the using simulated and meaning methods versus using reinforcement learning based methods, right? So, you know, uh, for similar meaning, uh, uh, we can basically uh, uh, first represent the placement as a multiple sequence. And uh, uh, we have uh, basically you, for, for the a cell, you have PMOS, you have NMOS, uh, and, uh, and then you can use the uh, sequence to represent the placement of the transistors within that sequence. Uh, and then uh, similar meaning uh, just can, it, it, it can just like uh, swap in the, the assignment of the, the, the transistors within this representation. And uh, and then you can optimize for some some rewards. Um, so for example, here you know it's just uh, uh, swapping uh, a PMOS and MOS pair, uh, and uh, from left to right. Uh, 
Um, and that will give you a different result and you can evaluate whether it's good or not. Uh, so that's similar limit. So reinforced learning, uh, if we take uh, this, uh, uh, the first approach of breaking down a optimization problem into uh, a reinforced learning problem, which is uh, uh, doing this sequence assignment problem, right? So uh, we can actually let the agent to decide uh, which pair of transistors to be placed at uh, ne as next step, right? So as shown in this animation, we're placing one at a time. So, so from left to right, we're placing uh, both PMOS and NMOS, PMOS and NMOS. Uh, sometimes it doesn't have to be uh, 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 existing PMOS, so you can have a dummy as well. Uh, so this is a decision made by a reinforcement learning agent. So it, it will just, uh, uh, once trained, it, it will know how to place uh, place this, uh, this uh, uh, cells given a, a circuit. And uh, the circuits will be represented as a graph, right? So you have that uh, as a graph and uh, the agent will basically uh, learning on the graph and decide uh, what's the, what is the uh, action uh, probabilities of picking which transistors to be placed at next step. So, uh, so that's for placement. Uh, and uh, uh, another use of our reinforced learning is uh, is in the routing of this uh, cell. So once the standard, uh, transistors are placed, uh, it has you have to route it, right? So you, there are wires on the metal layers that you have to route it. So you can connect these transistors. Now, um, this problem is uh, formulated uh, uh, a little differently. Uh, so the uh, 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 Instead of like make, making the whole routing problem as uh, as a reinforcing problem, uh, we are actually uh, break it down into two parts. So uh, one part is actually doing the mate routing, and the second part is actually fixing the DRCs. Uh, so and we are actually fixing the DRCs with the with the RL uh, reinforcement learning agent. Uh, so as uh, actually this animation didn't uh, kind of didn't repeat. But essentially, it's adding uh, it's adding one segment at a time, right? So this is also the sequence space, sequence based uh, uh, action space. So at each action, it, it basically just decide well where do I add another, where do I add another uh, uh, segment, and uh, it, it will grow until the DRCs are fixed, right? Um, so. Let me show show this uh, again. See, yeah. Now you can see. Originally, you you see a uh, many red, uh, uh, many red dotted line. These are the indicated DRCs. And uh, during the aging process, it will incrementally add additional wire segment, uh, to the to the layout until the DRCs are all fixed. Right. So this is also trainable. And uh, we found that actually this is uh, this model. Uh, we we only need to train this on. Uh, a few cells, and they will apply to almost like all cells. So, um, okay. Uh, so, uh, actually, we're quite excited about this uh, uh, work uh, because uh, it's able to actually generate um, uh, very good results. Uh, so, like compared to manual layout, uh, it's uh, most likely it's going to be smaller uh, or the same. Um, and uh, and also, I mean, basically the, the cell size is extremely smaller, so that's very important because you want to reduce the, the area of your your your, your design, right? The smaller the cell, the, the better the smaller area, and also more better electrical properties. Um, and also, it's able to actually uh, do like ninety more than ninety percent of the cells, and we are keeping improving this. Um, so these are actually uh, used in like multiple uh, technology nodes within Nvidia. Um, Okay, so uh, that's RL, right? So uh, you might ask, oh, okay, that's so good. Like, let's apply it to any problems we see, right? Um, which is actually uh, very difficult. Uh, let me talk about two major challenges. Uh, one is um, complexity challenges. Um, so, you know, like for example, I, I mentioned this earlier, uh, for this simple uh, routing game, uh, you know, this cell level routing. Uh, if we formulate this as uh, uh, we call it a vanilla routing game, right? Uh, which is like, uh, I'm going to assign one routing grid at a time. You can see I'm assigned routing grid at one routing grid at a time. You can see the green color is one net, right? So so I'm assigning this one at a time. And now I'm, I'm routing the, 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 the red ones and the routing the blue ones and the routing the, 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 the light red ones and so on and so forth, right? So 
uh, this this game surprisingly works uh, for smaller routing grids, right? So if you have like five by five or even ten by ten uh, ten routing grids, and uh, you know like uh, 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 only like five nets or six nets, this works. However, when I even just scale to a routing game that reflects a larger standard cell, uh, the state space of this uh, this game will be uh, like really huge, like ten to the nine hundred. Uh, so this makes the chaining of this kind of agent very hard to to do, and uh, so you know basically it, it's a very hard problem. Uh, however, when we uh, so so basically you know like if you want to apply RL, you want to really reduce the complexity, uh, basically the state space of your game. Uh, so so like the 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 DRC fixing game we talked about earlier has much smaller space. So the space is like 10 to the 75. So that's like just a slightly above the chess game, uh, which is uh, uh, easy, uh, much easier to solve. Um, so second one is the long evaluation time. Uh, so RL, uh, like most of EDA problems take a while, uh, need some analysis. And those analysis usually take a long time. Like for example, you want to do uh, STA, right? Uh, static time analysis uh, for the whole chip, right? It takes a long time. So then you cannot make that as part of your reinforcement learning loop, right? Because in reinforcement learning, uh, usually it requires um, thousands of iterations, and each iteration it requires hundreds of examples, hundreds of examples. So you know that's like millions kind of uh, evaluations, right? Think about running static time analysis a million times, you know, it's just like impossible, right? Um, so so. So that's why uh, that's why you know you we, this this big challenge you have to think about how to reduce that evaluation time. Uh, so a couple of methods. One is uh, if you use surrogate models to to basically generate fast feedback. So surrogate model means like instead of actually actually run the tool to to analyze the to get the reward, you can actually create a model to actually predict the reward. Right. So it's called surrogate model. So, um, but you know, this is one method that people commonly use. Uh, second one is uh, uh, instead of actually uh, actually doing the online training, you know, you can actually just take the offline data with some examples and just like learn the offline policy. Uh, so it's called off offline reinforcement learning, right? Or imitation learning. Um, so um, yeah, so there are so there are ways to to uh, go around this challenge, but I think these Two challenges are very big ones. So, so in my opinion, I think RL uh, is good for uh, when when you have enough information to make good decisions locally. Uh, why do I mean local decisions? For example, uh, in this DRC fixing game, uh, the the decisions of adding additional adding additional wire segment uh, here uh, is uh, basically depend on this pattern, right? So when when now I see this DRC pattern, I know I need to do this, right? So this is a local pattern. Uh, sim similar patterns can be seen in the Atari game that's like make reinforcement learning famous. So Atari game here, uh, yeah, like uh, uh, people can usually figure out a a a pattern, right? To to make decisions, like here, you know, if if the the you know um the this this dot is like coming this way. You want to move this way, right? So th these are patterns that can easily uh, solve or, or uh, extract from convolutional neural networks. However, when you have a hard problem like this, uh, where your your decisions is not local, right? Like for example, uh, this this uh, this this game is very hard for RL actually, uh, because they the this uh, this uh, uh, Person has to uh, actually get the key first before it can go upstairs, right? It goes to the next level. So this is a, you know, like basically this whole thing is is very global. It, it has to understand where is the key, and it has to understand the key is the key, you know, uh, required to go to the next level, right? So that's not a local decision, right? That's like a sequence, very long sequence of like a global decision. Uh, so that makes things hard. So this will basically make Reinforcement learning for uh for optimizations that require like basically the decisions of each variables are uh 
pretty like tightly coupled, like basically depend on each other. So you need like a global information to make decisions. Uh, that kind of problem become very hard for reinforcement learning. Okay. Um, so so no, that's why I, I think we, we 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 should look for other uh, more interesting techniques as well. Uh, and uh, that's uh, read really like what the Yana Ku is saying. Um, so you know obviously Yana Ku's the the you know uh, Turing Award winner. Uh, and uh, he uh, basically argues that um, you know reinforced learning is basically just taking like cherry on top of this cake, right? So this is his cake cake analogy. Um, and uh, which means like the, the information you're getting from reinforced learning is just a few bits of reward, right? That's the only thing you get. Um, and uh, uh, supervised learning is like icing on the cake um, because, uh, you know, in, in terms of like image recognition, um, it's uh, um, uh, the, number, the number of samples you can get is like a 10 to the 10,000 10, bits, right? Um, so, uh, and then he argued like self-supervised learning uh, actually can take the entire cake, right? The self-supervised learning uh, have much more information to to process. And I will mention like what, what exactly that means. Um, so this is a self-supervised learning. Essentially, uh, it's a system to try to predict the hidden part of the inputs, right? From the visible part of the inputs. Uh, so this, uh, when you say hidden and the visible, this can be, uh, you know, in 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 the like uh, vision framework, it's basically time or space, right? Uh, so so it can be like you you have the information of your current uh, previous time, but you want to predict the next time. You have information of your partial space, you want to predict you know, of other partial space, right? So so these are the you know kind of a uh, uh, self supervised, right? Basically, you divide your data into hidden part and uh, and the visible part, and you, you're trying to build a model to to compute from the visible part to the hidden part to predict that. So that's called self-supervised. Um, and one of the uh, 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 first, uh, I uh, wouldn't say first, but one of the key methods, uh, uh, self-supervised methods like a reg auto-regressing model. Uh, there are many other self-supervised models, but uh, I just want to mention like the self uh, this auto-regressive means, uh, uh, let's say you, you have, a, you have a, 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 a language translation task, so your data is basically uh, uh, one sequence of uh, input languages or one sequence of output languages. And uh, then your data example basically is, uh, 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 is the whole thing, right? So, so you have both the input and, uh, and, uh, and the output. If you consider the whole thing as, uh, as uh, one example, then your hidden part is basically the output, your, in, your, your visible part is the input, right? So basically build a, this uh, autoregressive way of generating, generating itself, right? Generating the, uh, the, uh, um, uh, the the output language based on uh, encoder decoder architecture, right? Um, and uh, so, why is this related to optimization? Right, that's the question. Um, so, uh, this is a kind of philo philo philosophical discussion, right? So, uh, I'm, I'm not I'm not saying this is true, right? I'm just saying this is my hypothesis. Uh, so, first of all, I think uh, almost all machine learning depend on a manifold hypothesis, right? So what is that manifold hypothesis? Uh, is that a hypothesis that many high dimensional data sets that occur in the real world actually lie along low dimensional manifolds inside the high dimensional space, All right? What does that mean? So if, when you have, let's say digits, right? They MNIST the digits and uh, very high dimensional because the MNIST is like, uh, it's like a 64 by 64 or I forgot, like basically it's a very high, high, high dimensional uh, uh, image data, right? Um, and uh, and if you map it like PCA and the map to like two dimensional space, you can clearly see uh, all the tools belong to this space, all the ones here space, and all the uh, six is here. Uh, so this is this is basically means uh, this high dimensional data belongs to a uh, in, inside a low dimensional low dimensional manifold, right? Uh, so now if I extend that hypothesis into optimization, then I would say uh, I would argue that. Optimizing solutions is a low dimensional data manifold conditioned on the problem inputs inside the high dimensional solution space, right? For this particular problem, right? Um, and, uh, uh, and uh, yeah. Um, and what's the, well, basically uh, the optimat optimality conditions such as like a KKT and uh, 
uh, these uh, are basically the many it's a manifold, right? So it, basically, the the solution space, uh, you know, let's say we will say you know the solution has to satisfy certain constraints, right? Like it has to satisfy the KKT constraint, right? So that pretty much means, you know, it's in inside a particular manifold. Uh, so so that means the data is much smaller, right? The the things that you need to record is is much smaller, and this can be conditional inferred. Um, so that kind of basically means you can actually learn to solve, uh, learn to generate the optimized solution, right? Because it's on a low dimension space, and and it's a uh, uh, that, that's exactly wh why this all the learning works, right? Um, you know, uh, learning basically means you you can extrapolate, right? Uh, from, from low dimension space. Um, so so this uh, gives us two two methods. One is you can create a generative model. So uh, once you learn this low dimension space, uh, conditioned on the on the inputs, uh, you know, basically the the, the problem definition, uh, you, you can directly generate solutions, right? Using generative models such as the the one we mentioned before, is the uh, auto regressive generative model, or uh, you can learn a very low dimensional data space. Uh, and once you have that, you can map all your solution to this low dimensional data space and then optimize directly on that latent space. That, then basically you have much smaller search space to optimize for. So, so two ways can improve um, uh, using self supervised learning can improve optimization, right? So I'm gonna actually talk about examples in the in the first one. Actually, how long do we have time? Oh, sorry, I think I'm too slow. Um, so, okay. Um, yeah, so this is a, uh, basically uh, talking about this uh, 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 transformer model that uh, that's basically taking uh, an input embedding and uh, and generate the output output the uh, uh, output sequence right taking an input sequence generating a, a output sequence. What I want to say is that this can be conditioned, right? So so what's condition? Like condition is like uh, this is the variable, right? So so essentially I can auto regressive uh, 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 not just based on input, but based on a condition on top of input. And let, let me show you an example. So uh, this language model with conditions, uh, we can see that uh, um, the uh, uh, target that, uh, so this is like multiple language, like you have you have uh, a Chinese language, you have like, you know, French or, or German, and, uh, you know, you can do this uh, uh, using the same network through the training, but they require this conditional number, right? So in Chinese it's VH and the French is like FR. So basically the model is trained with condition variables. And the way you inference is just send the right condition here, it will inference, right? So so this is what I'm talking about, the uh, conditional model. And we use the similar concept in, in, in our uh, gate sizing work, right? So for gate sizing, uh, what we do is uh, basically taking a, a sequence of uh, a sequence of uh, 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 gates, right? Uh, and it's uh, features. So this is the number of features. So it has like a layout feature, timing features, library features. Uh, just make sure this features doesn't have anything related to the gate size. Okay. Otherwise, it would be like a data leaking. Um, and then we try to try to use build this as a sequence based on the 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 timing path. And then we want to predict the output, right? Which is the the gate size. Well, what's the size of the 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 gates? Um, and the key here is this uh, condition variable called effort the level, um, because uh, for the uh, for a, any particular uh, uh, sequence, uh, get, uh, any particular uh, uh, timing pass, uh, you can size it differently. Sometimes you size, uh, you get a larger delay. Sometimes you get a lower delay, right? And the uh, larger delay usually have like lower power, and uh, uh, the uh, uh, a small delay usually have higher power, right? So uh, so that's a base, uh, the the optimization is like I want to achieve a a certain delay target, right? So that delay target is is basically this effort level. So we, we basically make the delay target as a as a as a level level. Uh, uh, it's just a normalized delay target, and uh, and uh, um, and here we basically showing that uh, uh, it's actually uh, what what in the in the real design what it looks like. Like the effort level has a has a certain distribution. Um, so actually, I want to speed up. So I'm gonna skip all this. So uh, just showing this works better than you know commercial tools and uh, stuff like that. Better, more accuracy, and um, yeah. Another important topic I'll talk about is physics-based model. Uh, so physics-based model uh, basically means it improves the chance for the model to find the correct manifold. Right? We talk about manifold, right? So uh, 
uh, not all the model works, right? You can stuck on like a fully connected layer on everything and uh, hopefully it works, but it doesn't, right? So to find a correct manifold, you need to you need to actually think about the physics, right? Uh, so there are three ways to the physics. You can do the observation bias, uh, basically do the symmetries. Like, you know, something has symmetry, then you make sure your data has the symmetrical input. This is basically the data augmentation. Or you can do inductive bias, um, which means uh, your model has to resemble the actual physics, right? So for example, CNN, like convolution neural network, um, basically has the inductive bias of uh, uh, local um, uh, tra translation invariance or active virus. Um, and, uh, and then you have learning bias. Uh, this is basically saying you have some cost functions so you want to optimize and then you want to add the learning bias. And uh, um, yeah, so, so I'm gonna show a couple examples. One is uh, uh, Fourier neural, net, neural operators. Uh, this is uh, 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 basically a recent work uh, uh, that uh, shows like how, how do you uh, using a neural network to solve partial differential equations. Um, and uh, essentially uh, it's this neural network or we call all operator uh, has a, a Fourier uh, uh, transform uh, up layer and then do some translation uh, uh, transforms up inside the Fourier domain and then uh, inverse Fourier back to the spatial domain, right? So, so, so this is the, the operator they are doing, and uh, they find that this can, you know, change this model can solve this partial differential equation. Uh, the reason, the reason is, uh, the partial differential equations can be solved with Fourier method, right? So Fourier transform will help solve partial differential equations. That's well known, right? So, so they basically uh, integrate that whole thing into the model. So, so that uh, the model can basically can, can learn that based on data samples. Um, so we apply the similar things we call the CFNO for lithography for computational lithography. Uh, the reason is that this, uh, lithography has the uh, equation like uh, like this. Uh, so it also have a Fourier up and and a Fourier down, right? So uh, inverse and 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 the, and the, uh, the, the forward Fourier and the inverse Fourier. So this is the top of the computation uh, uh, equations. So, uh, and uh, if you look at FNO, the Fourier neural operators is doing the same thing, but it's just the, the weights here are, are uh, learned, right? So, so we can, uh, essentially this is the, the, uh, the framework that uh, we think that can match uh, uh, the uh, uh, actual lithography and we actually uh, doing the same uh, uh, as well. And uh, we build a model to do both forward, forward lithography and the inverse lithography, both works quite well. Um, and another uh, interesting uh, thing we can do is called a, a physics informed neural network. Uh, this is basically adding learning bias, right? So uh, in addition to uh, the, uh, 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 so basically adding this additional rewards, right? So uh, additional loss functions. So for example, partial differential equation, this is also solving partial differential equation. So they can uh, uh, basically, uh, Come up with uh, these loss functions based on the the boundary conditions as well as the initial conditions, right? And also the the the, the equation itself. Uh, so they learn the networks to minimize this uh, equation loss, and uh, uh, that will basically uh, create a model that solves the the equation the equation partial differential equation. And uh, uh, we apply similar concept uh, in in clustering, right? For placement. So uh, when you have a clustering. Uh, you know, we, we actually uh, always observe that the clustering helps uh, helps improve placement quality. But the question is like, how do you actually do clustering, right? So, so you want to uh, you want to cluster to help PPA, and how do we do that? We basically directly come up with uh, with the PPA uh, objectives. This is loss function for PPA. So, if we can apply this uh, this PPA objective as loss functions, just like the the PIN physical informed networks, directly using the equation of loss here. Uh, it will drive the model to learn to learn a better uh, a better uh, uh, networks, uh, better clustering solutions. Right. So okay, I kind of fly through this uh, things. Uh, sorry about that. Um, didn't control the time very well. Uh, so last point uh, is machine learning for ED algorithm uh, in integration. Right. So uh, for practical use, uh, ED algorithms and the machine learning algorithms are uh, like different, right? They, they, they have different pros and cons. Uh, so essentially the ED algorithms can solve like abstract problem very efficiently. However, it's like oversimplification of dynamic complex problems. 
uh, machine learning, you know, you basically can solve any problem by learning from data. However, we rely too much on data and not leverage the mechanics of the problem, right? So that's why uh, we need to like increase both, so so we can do uh, we can uh, leverage the, the the best of all, all of all of uh, both worlds. So uh, yeah, uh, uh, Benjo, uh, another twenty award winner, uh, basically uh, um, proposed like this three or uh, like summarize a three uh, frameworks to integrate a, a machine learning framework of machine learning algorithms with uh, combinatorial optimization uh, tool. Uh, so this is this. This is a similar idea we can apply to EDA because you know the optimization orders uh, are similar. Um, so essentially, one is end-to-end -end learning, right? So you have problem definition using machine learning come up with solution. Th this is a you know the one solution, right? So the algorithm only provides data, uh, and uh, um, and another one is like learning to configure the algorithm, right? So you you have your your OR this is the operation research algorithm, which you can consider as EDA algorithms, and uh, and then you use machine learning and uh, to, to make some decision on like what's the parameter to use, uh, you know, things like that. And uh, 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 like what's the configuration for the, for the, for the uh, or what's constraints you want to apply uh, to the to the algorithm. And always we will we'll do that. Uh, and the third way is like fine grained integration. So you have an integrated way, right? So you, you make a, uh, uh, back, the backbone is still the uh, transition algorithm, but the inside the transition algorithm, you are using machine learning to, to do incremental decisions to help, uh, help you guide the, the uh, the, the this, uh, optimization algorithms. And, uh, and uh, I'm gonna skip this, basically I'll argue that end-to-end -end learning, you want to make sure it's physically informed. And uh, the, this is a cost uh, algorithm. And uh, this is uh, uh, like doing both traditional algorithms and the machine learning model at the same time. So yeah, uh, at pretty much at the end. So I think, uh, uh, practically, right? We talk about all talk about practice, right? Uh, integrating machine learning al and algorithms are still have challenge, right? Because there's the, most of machine learning algorithms uh, runs on GPU. Um, so if, if you want to make a good model, it needs to run on GPU, right? You can run it on CPU, but you know it usually cannot have a very big uh, good complexity. Uh, so so there's bottleneck, right? So the GPU, uh, uh, CPU is here, the GPU is here, and they, they, they don't share the same bandwidth. So that's the old bottleneck. Uh, so there's a problem. Um, so uh, uh, recently we announced there's a um, uh, called a Grease and Hopper. So, so we, we have a, a CPU as well, ARM-based CPU, uh, that actually have very fast uh, path between C, uh, GPU and the, and the CPU memory. So you can see the, the, mem the GPU can access the CPU memory uh, at a, a very high rate, right? It's much faster than before using PCIe. Um, so, so that's one solution. Basically, once we have this architecture, this, uh, the, the you know, Grease Hubble chips out, then, then you know, system build on this can have a much faster, uh, much better integration between uh, GPU-based algorithms and machine learning algorithms. Um, and, uh, and solution number two is, of course, moving all your algorithms from CPU to GPU, right? Like, for example, Jim Place, everything's on GPU, and also like simulation, this is everything on GPU. So you can achieve like very big speed up if you move all your algorithms to, G to GPU. So, in the end, I think, uh, you know, uh, in, in my mind, like before 2006, you know, uh, most of the, I guess, most of the EDA tools are doing the single thread CPU algorithms. Because there's only single thread, single core CPU of system available at that time, um, and then from 2006, since the multi-core uh, 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 CPU system become available, uh, most of EDA systems move to parallel like CPU algorithms. Um, in the future, right, we're talking about uh, CPU and the GPU cloud, uh, and uh, which has so so you can actually do uh, GPU accelerated algorithms as well as machine learning models and then also parallel CPU algorithms all together, right? So it's gonna be a very tight integration. So that's, I think in the future that the, what the EDA system will look like uh, and everything runs on cloud. Okay, so yeah, at the end, I, I think, uh, you know, I, I briefly talk about leverage machine learning to improve chip data automation. Uh, and uh, I talk about reinforced learning, self chip wide learning, physical informed machine learning. And I think machine learning should work together with existing algorithms. And uh, I think we 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 need a like basically a a, uh, a combination of paradigm and new new computing paradigm for EDA. All right, that's all. I hope I yeah. <laughs> all right, thank you very much, Mark. Um, so we have time for a few questions. Uh, is is there um, anyone who would like to ask a question? 
feel free to just unmute yourself and uh, and ask. All right, um, maybe I'll, I'll get the ball rolling. Uh, so, so I, I'm an applied mathematician, and and I'm curious as to whether you see, you know, it's like um, a need. You know, it's like I mean, are, are there sort of developments in sort of say fundamental applied mathematics? It's like which you think would be beneficial to to this problem, uh, which is somehow lacking in uh, sort of investment. I see. Um, yeah. So. Actually, this is like similar related to this slide, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um. So, yeah. So I I don't know if we we'll optimize solution something that really only like a manifold. Mm -hmm. So so. This is a hypothesis, right? So I think a lot of like even if you look at the learning learning theory, right? So I, I think that people are trying to develop better learning theories as well for deep learning. Um, right. So I, yeah, I, I I think some guidance will be interesting, right? So like, is that even possible, right? <laughs> to to actually learn a a optimized solution? I mean, in practice, it seems to to work, right? But mm -hmm. we don't know like you know uh, how um whether it's a uh, uh, well grounded or um, you know, just by luck, or what's the key aspect of making this work? Um, yeah. So, um, right. yeah. Yeah, because I, I think certainly it's like one of the, the main driving forces behind the use of machine learning and deep neural networks has been this idea that they are, you know, it's like they have very strong approximation power, right? But there have been recent results which suggest that just because a solution exists doesn't mean necessarily that it's easy to learn it using sort of this optimization framework and and there's a disconnect between the best representation it's like in what you can access through optimization so um, right i think that certainly yeah. does pose deep theoretical questions yeah yeah um uh yeah and uh, and another uh, of course is uh, uh another aspect is like how do you um like you know, find the better optimized solution. Like you know, like even um, when when you have a, a data, right? Like let's say you have data, some data, and how do you use that to guide your uh, guide your optimization search? Because most you know, a lot of time mm -hmm. optimization is a search process. Right. So yeah, so that's another uh, way of uh, thinking thinking about this problem. It's more less theoretical than the yeah the hypothesis here, but. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, more ethical, practical, I think. Like, uh, right. I think probably previous speakers also talked about this before uh, sure. in guiding guiding the search. Um, yeah, and uh, um, yeah, actually, you know, like if, if you think about a lot of like EDA problems, like, you know, best papers are won by, you know, apply a, uh, you know, new optimization algorithms from, from mass, right? Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, so you know, like you know, I, I think uh, um, any combination so far this kind of methods like a now guided optimizer uh, that can solve real problems that you know definitely uh, definitely be interesting to the EDA community as well. Right. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, if any other questions uh, from the audience. Um, last call. <laughs> uh, if if not, let's uh, thank Mark again. It's like for his very illuminating talk. Thank you very much. Thanks for the opportunity to talk about. Thank yeah. Bye. Thanks. Okay. Bye.